Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Call to Love podcast, where we discuss all things adoption and foster care and dive into the practical, the clinical, and most importantly, the biblical perspectives to help you and your family thrive. I'm Summer Colbert, adopted mom, director of adoption and foster ministry, and champion for the Arkansas Baptist Children and Family Ministries. Adoption and foster care aren't just a process. They are both unique invitations to go on a journey with the Lord where you will experience life-changing opportunities to grow in your faith and learn to love in an entirely new way. One thing is for sure, being called to love means you will never be the same. Welcome back, families, to the Called to Love podcast. I am so grateful that you have chosen to spend your time with us today, and I am so excited to welcome my very special guest and new friend, Bethany Adkins. Bethany, welcome to the show. Hi, Summer. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you. I I honestly cannot even remember how we got connected, and that's ridiculous because I feel like we've been emailing back and forth for months and trying to make this conversation happen. And it's the Lord's timing. It's right time. But I love that we both share a passion for family, adoption, and foster care. And it's really cool that we are both married to guys named Corey, and they're actually spelled the same way. So I love that we bonded over that already. Yes, I I know. I love that so much. It has been a long time. I was looking back at my emails and we started emailing almost a year ago, but that just shows how Stop. crazy and fast life is, which I, I know it doesn't feel that long. And Corey James and James Corey. Gotta yes. love it. Yes. She's married to a Corey James and I'm married to a James Corey. Guys, I didn't, you can't make this stuff up. It's so cool. So we're just, we're fast friends over here. And so I hope you guys feel that as we get started on our conversation today. And we did, we connected over adoption and foster care and you guys have a really crazy whirlwind, incredible story that I'm so excited for you to share in this conversation today. We have listeners, Bethany, who they are at the very beginning of this calling and they are just kind of dipping their toes into what this looks like and and if this is the Lord's calling for them. And we have families who are in the trenches, who are walking through the hard, who are experiencing the realization of the brokenness that is foster care and adoption. And then we have seasoned families who are on the other side of this going, man, I wish I knew this, or man, I wish I had done this better. And so we kind of run the gamut in terms of, of this family that we call called to love here. And so as we share um, today, I just wanted to kind of give you that perspective. So let's get started. Let's just let our families have a chance to get to know you a little bit more. Tell us about your family and then we'll dive into where the Lord has had you over the last couple of years. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So um, like she said, my name is Bethany, married to Corey. We're from Ohio and we have three biological kids, um, a 12-year-old boy, nine-year-old girl, three and a half-year-old girl. And we've been licensed for almost two years now. It has been a whirlwind. Um, Currently, we just have one foster baby. um, And at the most at one time, we had nine. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Never the plan. But does it ever go as planned? (laughs) Never. Yes. When we give God our plans, he laughs. Yep, exactly. That's so awesome. And you guys have a podcast as well. We do. We have a podcast called A Force to Be Reckoned With. It's my husband and I, and we are just talking to families in the thick of it, raising kiddos and um, calling them to rise up, live the life that God is calling you to. And, you know, we're raising the next generation. So that's what we talk about. I love that. That's so fantastic. Okay. So dive into this whirlwind of a journey that you've had over the last couple of years. Let's start with the calling. I mean, you, you shared, you have three biological kids for all intents and purposes, our culture, our society would say, Hey, you're good. You're set. You've got your hands full. No reason to trouble yourself with, you know, other people's children. Essentially we hear that a lot and feedback from, you know, people talking about foster care specifically. So talk to us about when the Lord first started speaking to your heart specifically you and your husband about opening your home to foster care. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you said there is what the world um, kind of dictates for us. And man, is that true? And I truly believe it, especially as we're stepping into foster care. The enemy hates families. He hates, um, he wants to destroy families. And so he will do everything in his power to convince us to not do foster care. And that was was our case all the way back to when I was um, a little girl. My parents were foster parents and I actually have two adopted sisters. And I can't even say anything like super negative about the journey. I love my sisters. Um, I mean, it was hard, of course, but nothing like 
so, so traumatic. I had a great childhood, yeah. but I just always was like, yeah, I don't think I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this when I get up. So get older. So when I met my husband, um, you know, we're just courting and talking about life and getting married. It was always like, yep, we want kids. Yep. We want to travel. And by the way, I never want to do foster care. And he was like, <laughs> great, me either. And so <laughs> we kind of went along on our merry way. We had, um, three kids. We lived in California for a while. Um, we're from Ohio, lived there for about five years to run a family business. And then we ended up, the Lord called us home, which is a whole other story. Um, we weren't really sure why, but lots of answers on that now. And yeah. part of that was when we came home, um, God planted us right in the middle of a community of incredible, incredible people um, and couples specifically. And all of them were foster parents. Oh, wow. And so over the next two years, it was from about 2019 to 2021, we kind of just spent life um, doing community with these people and getting a front row seat to foster care and what that looked like and learning that there's faces to these stories and they're real kids and just falling in love with the kids and falling in love with the families um, pretty quickly. And I was like, OK, we actually need to do this. I'm like, I commit to a lot. That's just my personality. I have a business. Yeah. I work a job. And so like pretty quickly, I was like, oh, there's a need. Like we're fully capable. We're doing this. Um, but it took my husband about a year and a half and he was like a hard no. Um, but here we are two years later. So yeah. Yeah. What did that look like for y'all? Because I, I love that you bring that up, Bethany, because it we do see that typically that there's one spouse that's really filling that initial nudge that kind of leads the charge of the calling. And then sometimes they're pulling their spouse kind of along the way. And it can be a struggle and it can really prolong the process of, I don't want to say obedience because God's timing is perfect, but it really can, um, it, it takes a little while for hearts to be aligned and ready to, to take those first steps. And so what did that look like for you guys really just kind of your hearts falling into alignment and you're like, okay, yes, we're doing this. Yeah. Um, Corey and I both have like very audacious personalities. Like we move cross country twice. We've run businesses. We've done lots of things. And so a lot of the times like we're up for pretty much anything. Yeah. Um, but so it's rare when we aren't. And so when we aren't, it's one of those things where like we're not moving forward until we really are on the same page. And so yeah. um, what that looks like is prayer, just a lot of prayer. And for me, it's frustrating because I'm an action taker and I'm not patient, but you yeah. know, I think that that's the Lord refining me and saying, all right, well, you're going to give it to me and you're not going to yeah. control this. So that's what, um, about a year and a half looked like. And obviously some arguments and me, you know, pushing because that's who I am and saying, why, why aren't you doing this? Don't you know there's yeah. kids out there? Um, but for him really, I do think that in God, it was in God's timing and his heart just wasn't there yet. Um, he loves kids. He um, he has always coached. He went to school for teaching, even though he never actually um, pursued the degree once he graduated. And so for him, there were two pieces of his no. It was, I'm going to get too attached, which we hear a lot. Yeah. And um, the other one was, foster families are so weird. And we are like so active in the community and our kids are sports. And he's like, and I just don't want to be weird. So I'm, and I'm like, well, we already are weird. So yeah, but um, it was a lot of hard conversations and just, this is where I'm at. And he would say, well, this is where I'm at. And so lots of prayer. And even when we started pursuing, he, it wasn't ever like, okay, I'm ready. It was me continuously taking it to the Lord and saying, Lord, if this, if you have this for us, please um, make a way for it. And so when it happened, it was one day he just said, okay, like I would be open to you calling the county and see what this looks like. And it was just following one bread crumb, crumb after the other. Okay. I love that. That's really, I appreciate you being so honest about that because I, I think that's so true of, of most of our relationships. For um, my husband, I definitely was the one leading the charge. I was going to the meetings. I was filling out the paperwork. I, you know, I was taking point on a lot of that. And he was just kind of like, okay, you know, he was never just like a no, but he, he was hesitant more so. And I, I'm very much the, you know, I just want to charge forward. And then I'm grateful to my husband who tempers me and the Lord who tempers me even more um, because he does have our best in mind, not just for us, but for the kids that, you know, that we're talking about serving as well. So you brought up a great point too, that I want to come back to Bethany. And that is that the enemy hates families. 
And he hates the idea of the restoration of a family, whether that is reunification through foster care, whether that is through adoption. And so it can be really difficult as we're wrestling with our own drive, we're wrestling with what we think we should do, we're seeing the urgency of the need. And then there's all these voices speaking into us. You know, our spouse may not be aligned. There might be loving family members that are like, hey, this is not a good idea. What, what about this? What about that? And so Talk about what that has looked like for you guys as far as the voices that have spoken into your journey, maybe as you were getting started or even along the way. And then also tie in, like there's the enemy's voice that's speaking lies and fear and doubt and all those things. And then the Lord ultimately speaking into you as well. Talk about what that was like to kind of navigate all the voices in your calling. Yeah. I feel like every one of your questions is an entire podcast episode. I know, right? <laughs> it's all so good because these are all very common, all very common questions. And yeah. um concerns that people have. And so, yeah, when it comes to the different voices, 100%, I wholeheartedly agree that like when you're stepping into this, the enemy knows that and he wants to do everything to, I mean, he is, he's um, the ultimate deceiver. He wants to steal, kill, destroy. And he, that is true for families because that's God's design. And so he will speak discouragement into your life. Um, and I'm sure you guys hear too, but in our community of friends, they always say, all right, so as soon as you get licensed, just be ready. Your plumbing's going to break. Your car's going to yes. break down. You're going to probably lose your job because the enemy is going to do everything he can to discourage you and prevent you from stepping into this because it's that so impactful true. of kingdom work. And so that's just one piece of it. And then you have the human um, relational dynamic of it. And um a good friend of mine said this in a talk that she did, but also I don't know if she's the originator. I can't, I keep meaning to look this up, but it might be Jason Johnson, but um, in your life, there will be people who love you and there will be people who get you. And not always do those two things happen together. So yes. people who love you might be your parents or your siblings or your in-laws and they love you, but that sometimes that love um comes with voices of concern and voices of concern for your kids. And so hesitation because this is weird and uncomfortable. Um, but in this community, it's so important to cling to people who get you and they get the call and they understand that, yes, we get this because God has called us to this too. And even though the world doesn't understand, we understand um, and we're not called to be like the world. So I think it's so important to understand that and not hold anger toward the people who love you but don't get you, but just keep that in mind. Fall will be here before we know it. And as you start to think about back to school, I want to encourage you to think about how you can be praying for your kids this coming school year. It's so easy to get caught up in all of the daily tasks of parenting, right? We're getting school supplies, coordinating schedules, doing the laundry, making snacks, then making more snacks, am I right? But as Christian parents, it's important to remember the big picture. The one thing that truly matters is teaching our kids to know, love, follow, and share Jesus. And so because of that, I am so excited to tell you that the Christian Parenting 2024-2025 Prayer Journal is now available. It's called A Life of Faith, Knowing, Loving, Following, and Sharing Jesus. And it is a prayer journal from Christian Parenting that was created just for you. This journal will guide you in praying over your kids every week of the coming school year. Together, we will pray that our children will know Jesus as their Savior, love Him with their hearts, minds, and strength, and follow Him faithfully through their entire lives and boldly share His good news with others. Thousands of parents use this journal every year, so join us as together we pray that our kids live a full life of faith. You can visit cpgive.org to request your school year prayer journal, A Life of Faith. Again, that's cpgive.org and request your copy of A Life of Faith today. Now let's get back to the conversation. That is so fantastic. I wish I would have known that and understood that better when we first started our journey because there was some deep hurt that took years to heal because I was like, you celebrated when I got pregnant. Like, why wouldn't you celebrate when we were doing this? Like, that doesn't make sense. But allowing them that space to come along in their own journeys of understanding and seeing, you know, our story come to fruition with the calling that God had given us. And I, I'm so with you. I laughed out loud because legit every single time we've started a process, there has been something. My husband got demoted or, you know, his salary was cut. We had different things go wrong. It was one thing after another. And it was really a question of 
are you in this or not? Because, and, and warfare is very real. And that's not something that we necessarily, because we, we get this idea, I think, and I certainly was guilty of this. Our listeners know this, that, you know, I came into adoption and, you know, very rose colored glasses and this is so pretty and it's just going to be amazing. And I'm just going to make up my mind. And one day this is all just going to come together and it's going to be this, you know, Pinterest, Instagram, everything moment. And, and when it crashed and burned, many steps along the way, I just did not know what to do with myself. And so I actually, I was reading yesterday. I love how the Lord just brings fresh light and understanding to scripture, you know, just with different places that we're at. And so I, I just felt compelled to pick up James chapter one and, you know, the verses that say, starting verse two, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Mm. And as we're talking about all of this resistance that we experience, and I want to dive a little bit more into that because you've kind of given us the the intro to your story, and now we're going to get into some of the reality. But, you know, I didn't understand that the trials, the hard things, the, the opposition that we experienced all were evidence of God's love for me because he wanted to me to become the person that I am on the other side of this. Yeah. Right. And, and that's true for every single person that he calls to this specific calling. He uses all kinds of things, but to be grateful for the trials, to be grateful for the hard, that's a really, really challenging concept. Right. So I want to lean into that a little bit for you guys and just kind of hear how the Lord has walked through that with you and, and what those trials look like once you started actually receiving kids in your home and experiencing the reality of the hard. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I love, love that verse in James. And I think that so many, like our our human, like selfish, our fleshly response is to skip to the end of that verse where it says you'll yeah. be lacking nothing. Yeah. But if you read that first part of the verse and all of the things that we have to go through to get to that, that's part of sanctification. That's part of being yeah. refined. And, um, you know, it's like the breaking down of a muscle and well, the building up a muscle in order to build a muscle, you have to be broken down first. Right. And, and I truly believe that that's what the Lord does to us in our faith walk in our family walk in our marriages and everything that we do. And so, um, sanctification, we almost titled an episode this, but we haven't even, we haven't done it yet, but sanctification sucks yeah. and <laughs> it does. It's hard. It's painful. It's not pretty. Um, I think that sometimes we listen to sermons and, you know, we go to church and we hear these things and we, it, it sounds so beautiful and tied up in a pretty bow. But the reality is that when you're doing mission work and you really are, I mean, we truly are at war and that's, that's the theme of our podcast. We start out saying we're at war, but it's not against your neighbors. It's not against, um, the people in your community. It's, it's not against flesh and blood. It's against spiritual forces. And we have to remind ourselves of that. And we have to find people who will remind ourselves of that because um, it's true and it's hard. And it's when you're down and you're beaten down on the floor and curled up in the fetal position, you have to find people who get it and are going to help you pick you back up because it is hard. Um, And so, I mean, there's, there's so much. I, I, yeah, I mean, change in pay structures, um, having to buy cars that were out of our price range because in a matter of two months, we welcomed four kids in our house unexpectedly. Um, family not getting it, just feeling so completely misunderstood and hurt by people who were so close and dear to us. And then being so completely surprised and caught off guard by the people who chose to step up for us. I mean, there's beautiful yeah. things too. And so I don't want to make it all sound horrible. But yeah. even in the hard and the horrible and the painful, um, if you ask me if I would do it over again, I would say a thousand percent because mm-hmm. it has truly made me and my family and my children stronger. And um, to now it's to the point where when you walk through the fire, that is where it's like, all right, Lord, like this is hard and this hurts, um, but I know you're growing me and I know you're here with me and I know that I'm on the right track because it's uh, it's almost eerie when a life is easy. It's like, okay, are we doing something wrong here? You know what yeah. I mean? So I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense, but. It does make sense. And I completely agree with that. And you know, what's crazy is you can experience all of those in a single day in these, in this calling, like you can have a really beautiful moment. And then it absolutely is like a dumpster fire 30 minutes later and you just don't know. And, and so there is a lot, just that, that idea of clinging to the Lord. And I, 
going back to that verse a little bit, I'm a total nerd. And so I love to dive into the commentaries and different things like that and understand a little bit more of the context of the scriptures. And it, it brought out something in me. It was, it was talking about um, there's a difference between trials and there's holy trials that God allows for our benefit. And then there's trials as a result of our sinful nature. And so I feel like stepping into this calling in general, it it is a holy trial because you are welcoming brokenness and you can't welcome brokenness into your life and into your home without experiencing, you know, just some of the ripple effect of that brokenness. And so I think that's important for us to remember. And and it's easy for you and I, because I, I can absolutely echo the same thing you said. If I, I would not want to be the person that I was when God first started us in those first few steps on our journey and, and looking how far we've come. We're over 10 years into ours, you know, since he first called us and we first started pursuing adoption specifically and, and everything that he has us doing now. But I'm like, man, there have been some, like you talked about laying on the floor in the fetal position moments and seasons, days, weeks, years, where I just, I did well to keep everybody alive. You know, and so I feel like that represents probably some of our listeners and they're like, yeah, that's great that you guys feel really rosy on the other side of this, but right now I'm drowning. Mm -hmm. So what advice, what wisdom, what encouragement would you offer to somebody who's in that space where they are just doing their best to put one foot in front of the other? They are questioning their calling. This is messy. I don't want to do this anymore. I want out. The Lord hasn't released me. Help. Yeah. Well, I will say that I can relate totally. I'll just dive into, do you mind if I dive into a little bit of our foster care story? Please. Yes. So, and it's a little bit confusing, so I'm going to try to explain it well, but we, when we got licensed, I mean, you know, the, the county is all nationwide. It's just a huge crisis right now, but we got licensed yeah. in September of 2022. And the next day we got a call for two kiddos, a four-year-old girl and a newborn baby boy. And we said, yes. Um, once they came to our home, we found out that they had two older brothers and they were placed in a different foster home because at the time we weren't licensed for that many kids. And also um, we were so new at it that we were unsure, although we did offer for them to come and it just ended up never working out. Mm. Well, over the course of the next year, um, mom worked really hard to get them back and she was doing well, but then had a, a really major family tragedy happen and ended up relapsing. And the kids, so four kids, three different dads, um, with foster care, the priority, at least in Ohio, is kinship. So mm -hmm. they ended up getting removed from our home. The two that were in our home were, were split different ways. Um, the two that were in the other home were split different ways and, and spreading across states. Um, wow. And so at that point, the, the baby that we had was, was 11 months so we had almost had them a year. He was calling us mama and dada. He was he was our family. And so was so was his sister. Um, but she was older and knew the family she was going to. Yeah. And it's just one of those moments where you're like, all right, like I give up, God. Like, why is this happening? Not only is it devastating that they're leaving our home, they're being separated, siblings who are bonded and love each other. And we have offered to keep them in our home and they're still being split up. And um, and they're, they were going to situations, sometimes with kinship, they're not ideal. And yeah. there were many red flags that we raised, um, but just because of the law and the broken system, they went anyway. Yeah. And it didn't even end there. Um, over the next eight weeks after the 11-month-old left, we um, had stayed connected to a family member of his who kept us in the loop. And um, we just got update after update after update of just horrible things happening. And mm -hmm. so it's like, it's a weird thing to grieve the loss of a child that exists and yeah. isn't your own, but you feel is your own. Right. That they, I think they call it ambiguous loss. But then not only that, to know that they're out in the world and they're, um, they're not struggling. What's the word I'm looking for? They're suffering. They're suffering. Yeah. And so it was like eight weeks of, of fighting with the county and advocating for these kids. And um, just like that was the point. I just remember I would, I would call my – and I'm not an anxious person. But at that point, I was so low and so devastated, sad for the kids that they're split up, sad for the mom who lost her kids. You know, she's, the case is pretty much over. Yeah. And um, she's pregnant again. And just the whole situation, you know, sad for my kids and myself because he was our son and she was our daughter. And um, it just, none of it made sense. 
But um, yeah, I've so for people that are in those pits where, you know, I was calling my husband. I'm like, you have to come home. I'm like, I'm having an anxiety attack right now. Yeah. It's horrible. Um, I would just say that those are the moments, those right there, the most painful moments in your story. Those are the ones where you feel so alone and you have to remember that you're not. And um, we had, if you don't have community, I, I hope that you can force yourself to get plugged in um, because I was like not functioning. It was, it was really hard. And we had people who were just, who prayed over us, prayed for the case. And I truly believe that the way the case ended is because of the prayers, because we truly, the par prayer is so po powerful. And um, yeah, so I would say in those moments, find your people, the people who get it, cling to Jesus, even though you don't want to. And it's probably the last thing that you want to do. And another really powerful thing for me, like I just love music. So during that time, I just, I made some playlists that um, I just had on repeat over and over and over. And also just be encouraged that life is full of peaks and valleys and you're not going to be there forever. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good reminder. I think it's important for us to remember because going back to that societal expectation, you know, as women, especially we're expected to have it all together to, to have all of our ducks in a row, to, to not struggle, to, to do all the things, right. To run a major corporation and our house look perfect and spotless and our children be perfectly well behaved. And, you know, there's just this idea and this pressure that we put on ourselves. And so when we need help, yeah. we feel ashamed to even need it and, and embarrassed to ask for it. And so I think it's really important, you know, you bringing up that point of finding your people that will meet you in the midst of all of that. But talk a little bit about that of just overcoming any hesitation to ask for the help when you need it. Oh yeah. I hate asking for help. Like <laughs> me too. I would rather die. Than ask for right. help. And so, um, Thankfully, uh, we have friends who know that about us and they're like, okay, step aside, we're helping you anyway. Yeah. But I would also say it's it's so humbling to, and it it hurts at first, you know, like we, we had people bring us meals, we had people write us cards, um, people who would watch our kids. Um, we have something called a care community, which it's a nonprofit that we're part of. They build them around families. And so somebody might come pick up your laundry. It's It's wonderful. Yeah. But for me, I would rather like, even though I'm drowning, I'd rather volunteer for like 10 care communities and let my house be up in flames. <laughs> yeah. So I would just say that um, something I realized in the receiving help, well, one, like I was at a point where I had to because otherwise we wouldn't have made it. Yeah. But in that, I realized somebody, maybe somebody said this to me or maybe it was just like the Lord, I don't know. But like you are allowing people, there are people who love the idea of foster care and they can't for whatever reason be licensed. Right. But at the end of the day, we're all called to be part of this, you know, to care for the widows and orphans. And so for someone else who wants to bring you a meal or drop off or pick up laundry and do your laundry, you're allowing them to be part of foster care and be the hands and feet of Jesus in the way that the Lord is calling them to. So who are you to stop them from doing what the Lord is asking them to do. And yeah. so for me, I'm like, okay, I can do that. I don't, I'll, I'll let them drop off a meal because I, it's helpful to me. And also that is their piece in this. And that's really, really important. That was part one of Radically Changed by a Call to Love with Bethany Adkins and Summer Colbert. So be sure to look out for next week's episode to listen to part two. I love to hear from listeners, and so I would love to connect with you to hear your stories and answer your questions right here on the show. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram, send me a direct message, or send me an email at the link in today's show notes. I pray you have been encouraged by today's episode to walk in faith and continue to embrace your own call to love. Until next time, blessings, sweet friends.